Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Kate Forbes on the Scottish Budget for 2020-2021. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement. I would encourage those members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today I present the Scottish Budget for 2020-21. This is a budget that offers vision and leadership at a crucial moment for our country. Last week, the UK formally left the European Union and entered the transition period that is intended to last until December. This was not an outcome of Scotland's choosing, but until Scotland has the opportunity to choose a different path, we must deliver the best possible outcome for the people we represent. This budget provides an early opportunity for us to do that. It sets out a bold and ambitious program which we believe will have widespread public support and as a result should command the support of this chamber. We will confirm today significant investment in our response to the global climate emergency to strengthen our economy and to improve our public services. Because this is a budget that has well-being and fairness at its very heart. It's a progressive budget and it will provide extra help to those who need it most, tackling inequalities and poverty, especially child poverty. Our wellbeing approach to the budget prioritises actions that have the greatest impact on improving lives across Scotland now and creating the conditions that are required to ensure wellbeing for future generations. But it is also a budget presented in the context of the UK government's decision to defer its budget last November. This has obliged us to make significant changes to this year's budget process. And with support from the Finance Committee, we have a bespoke budget process this year. The late UK budget has required the Scottish government to present tax and spending plans for Scotland without certainty about our fiscal position next year. The timetable agreed with the Finance Committee should see the budget bill passed on the 5th of March, the week before the UK budget on the 11th of March. We will have passed into law our spending plans, doing what we can to provide certainty and stability on behalf of the people of Scotland. But the financial and economic risk will not end there. The UK budget will still present a significant risk to the Scottish budget. This budget contains our best estimate minimum level of funding that will be available to the Scottish Government in 2020-21. However, updated economic forecasts and block grant adjustments will only be available when the UK budget is published. That requires the Scottish Government to use provisional forecasts as the basis for setting budgets, in line with the up-to-date forecasts of devolved tax income and social security expenditure undertaken by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. We have had to make assumptions about the Barnet consequentials that will be added to the Scottish bloc as a result of the UK budget. And we've had to take decisions about devolved tax policy without knowledge of future UK policy. That position is not one of our choosing. It creates unnecessary challenges for public bodies, for businesses and for taxpayers right across Scotland. The current timetable provides for royal assent by the 30th of March. Delaying the Scottish budget further would have undermined parliamentary scrutiny, increasing the risk that we would run out of time to pass the budget bill. Such an outcome would be in nobody's interest. Today's budget aims to provide as much certainty as possible to taxpayers and to public bodies, above all to local authorities who urgently need to set their own budgets for the year ahead. It's hoped that all of Parliament will unite behind these tax and spending plans. The Scottish Government is, of course, open to discussion with all parties about how we best achieve that, but the clock is ticking. A focus on fairness and our collective well-being underpins the measures we are taking to drive 
and inclusive economy, to tackle poverty and to respond to climate change through a just transition. It also drives our approach to Scottish public services. This budget will protect and improve these services as part of our strong social contract with the people of Scotland. In total, presiding officer, this budget provides for the first time ever funding of more than 15 billion pounds for our health and care services. We are providing the capital for our programme of elective care centres. We're investing more than £9.4 billion in health and social care partnerships. And we're investing £117 million, million pounds in mental health. We're delivering an increase of nearly 60% in funding to reduce harm from alcohol and drugs, including support for the work of the new Drugs Deaths Task Force. We're also providing a real terms increase in local government revenue support as part of an overall funding package that delivers our key commitment on early learning and childcare, that funds a fair pay deal for our teachers and invests more than £120 million targeted at closing the attainment gap, with a further £62 million provided out with the settlement through the Attainment Scotland Fund. And to help maintain low levels of reported crime and keep our communities safe, we are providing an additional £37 million for the Scottish Police Authority resource budget. That is well above the real terms increase we had promised and will ensure Police Scotland have the money they require to maintain officer numbers at current levels. That is coupled with an extra £6.5 million for community justice interventions as part of our efforts to reduce re-offending rates. The budget provides capital funding of nearly £70 million for the prisons estate, including a replacement for HMP Barlini and investment in the female estate. Now, presiding officer, the budget and the economy are, of course, inextricably linked, and both are being impacted by EU exit. Last week, the Bank of England downgraded its projections for the UK economy. The Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts for the Scottish economy published today again confirm that not only has uncertainty around leaving the EU already held back growth over recent years, but that EU exit will continue to be bad for our economy, holding back growth in trade and productivity. But despite those challenging economic conditions, the economy continues to grow. A strong labour market with high employment and low unemployment, with earnings growth that is outperforming previous forecasts. However, we must remember that the economic and fiscal forecasts that underpin this budget assume that a sensible agreement will be reached between the EU and the UK. Should that not be the case, we may be forced to reconsider spending plans across all portfolios in order to mitigate as much as we can the unnecessary harm that would be caused if no agreement is reached. The economic outlook has informed the progressive approach taken in this budget to tax. We have already the most progressive, fair and balanced income tax system in the UK, one that raises additional revenue from those who can most afford it and protects public spending. This helps us to make Scotland the kind of country that we want it to be. It funds our public services, supports our economic infrastructure and helps those most in need. In 2017, in the interests of providing certainty, the Scottish Government made a commitment that Scotland's income tax structure was settled for at least the duration of this Parliament. And, presiding officer, today we are keeping that promise. There will be no increase to any of the rates of income tax this year. No Scottish income taxpayer will pay more income tax in 2020-21 on their current income than they do this year. To cement the progressivity of our tax system, 
we will increase the basic and intermediate rate thresholds by inflation to protect our lowest and middle earning taxpayers. The higher and top rate thresholds will be frozen. That will ensure that 56% of Scottish taxpayers pay less than they would if they lived elsewhere in the UK. Scotland will continue to be the lowest tax part of the UK for the majority of income taxpayers. The Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission has forecast that our decision to freeze the higher rate threshold will raise an additional £51 million in 2020-21 compared to an assumed inflationary increase. The Commission's forecasts show that, in total, Scottish income tax will raise over £12 billion in 2020-21, partly driven by continued growth in earnings. On land and buildings transaction tax, we're proposing to introduce a new 2% band for non-residential leases only, applying to transactions where the net present value of rental income over the period of the lease is above £2 million. The move to a three-band structure will ensure that our tax system continues to be seen as progressive and fair in keeping with the Scottish approach to taxation. Legislation will be introduced to the Scottish Parliament to enable this change to come into effect from the 7th of February 2020. But it will not apply if the contract for a transaction was entered into prior to the 6th of February 2020. There will be no further changes to LBTT, providing certainty to taxpayers purchasing land and property. We will be using the resources raised through the tax decisions in this budget to support our public services and meet our ambitious targets on child poverty, including through initiatives such as the Scottish Child Payment. This government believes that that is the right decision for Scotland. Based on previous commitments at the UK Autumn Budget 2018, we do not expect income tax divergence between Scotland and the rest of the UK to increase in 2020-21. But if there is any divergence, presiding officer, it will not be because of decisions made here. It will be because the UK government is yet again cutting taxes for high earners. <laughs> presiding officer, I'll now turn to the further spending commitments announced in this budget. Last year, the First Minister led the way in acknowledging the climate emergency. Across the world, we are seeing an increasingly unified response to what is a fundamental issue for us all and for future generations. We promised this would be a budget that steps up the delivery of our ambition to tackle climate change. And, presiding officer, today we deliver on that promise. Scotland's transition to net zero emissions is a national endeavour and changes are needed across the whole of society. We all share in the opportunities that this will bring through our commitment to delivering a Green New Deal and securing a just transition. This budget confirms that the Scottish Government will play its part, guided by the expert advice provided by the Committee on Climate Change and the Climate Emergency Response Group. I can therefore announce that we are meeting our pledge to increase the proportion of investment directed towards low carbon infrastructure each year with £1.8 billion of capital investment in specific projects to reduce emissions. That is an increase in low carbon investment of over £500 million compared with last year. The budget provides additional funding in the key areas of transport, agriculture, heat and energy. Promoting a greater shift to public transport will be key to our success. We are increasing overall funding for rail and bus services, including concessionary travel, by £286 million to a total of £1.55 billion in 2020 21. Investment in active travel will increase 
to over £85 million, promoting cycling, walking and more sustainable transport. The £83 million Future Transport Fund will see us investing in low carbon and other transformational initiatives, including low emission and electric buses, bus prioritisation, electric vehicle charging points infrastructure and the Switched On Towns and Cities programme. We're providing £5 million to help the shift to electric vehicles in the justice sector and we are increasing to £35 million low carbon transport loan fund, supporting those who need uh, support to drive to transition to low emission vehicles. Emissions from agriculture and other land uses need to reduce as part of our climate plan. But we need to work in partnership with farmers and other land managers to achieve that. We're providing an initial £40 million investment in the Agricultural Transformation Programme to help develop the tools and the techniques that are needed. We're also increasing our investment in forestry to over £64 million in 2020-21 up from £59 million as part of our response to the recommendation made by the Committee on Climate Change that we need to move towards planting levels of 15,000 hectares per year as soon as we can. And we confirm today a new £120 million heat transition deal which recognises the need to boost the scale and pace of growth in decarbonising our homes and buildings. That will ensure we seize the huge economic opportunity renewable heat will present as part of a just transition, delivering thousands of new green jobs. This heat deal includes a £50 million Heat Network's Early Adopter Challenge Fund for local authorities and a £10 million fund to support hydrogen heat demonstrator projects this budget also secures an increase in capital funding for energy efficiency measures to £151 million. These measures alone represent a substantial plan of action for the year ahead, but we must and we will go further. The climate emergency demands immediate action, but it also requires genuine long-term commitment if we are to deliver against our statutory emissions reductions targets. I have three further announcements to make which underline the depth of this government's longer term commitment. Firstly, we will incentivise local authorities to use the assets and the levers at their disposal to reduce emissions and boost the economy by unlocking up to £200 million of revenue financed investment in projects across Scotland through our Green Growth Accelerator. Secondly, we commit now that we will ring fence an additional £2 billion of transformational infrastructure investment over the next parliamentary term for measures to support the delivery of the climate change plan. Let nobody doubt that this government will prioritise multi-year investment in low carbon measures at the scale required to help tackle the climate emergency. These measures will build on the recommendations of the Infrastructure Commission with further detail to be provided in the Infrastructure Investment Plan later this year. Finally, Presiding Officer, all the evidence suggests that one of the most effective ways of locking in carbon is to restore our peatland. This offers a clear nature-based solution to the climate crisis. The Committee on Climate Change have shown that every £1 spent on peatland restoration brings £4 of social benefit through reduced emissions, improved water quality and flood mitigation. Not only will we increase investment in peatland restoration to £20 million next year, an increase of £6 million compared to this year, we will go further. Today, this government is committing to invest more than a quarter of a billion pounds in peatland restoration over the next 10 years. That will enable large-scale restoration projects to be developed, enhancing biodiversity in some of the most important habitats in Europe, 
securing jobs in the rural economy and, based on initial estimates, delivering greenhouse gas emission reductions of up to 0.8 million tonnes a year by 2032. The move to net zero will have many impacts, including on our economy, as consumption patterns change and ways of doing business adapt. There will be challenges, but there are also new opportunities. This government is committed to helping Scotland's economy adjust at a time when we must also work hard to mitigate the impacts of EU exit, drive productivity and ensure we are globally competitive. Infrastructure investment remains key to our success. Overall, today's budget, backed with increased capital borrowing, will boost infrastructure investment by nearly £1 billion in the first year of our national infrastructure mission, which is to increase annual investment between 2019-20 and 2025-26 by 1% of GDP. That includes further investment in sustainable transport and digital through the R100 programme and more than £800 million of investment in affordable housing as we continue to progress our target of 50,000 affordable homes. <laughs> this coming year will also bring important progress in our network of support for Scotland's businesses. We're establishing the Scottish National Investment Bank with £220 million of direct investment in 2020-21 by the Scottish Government and the South of Scotland Enterprise will receive £28 million of funding to provide targeted support for businesses there. Our approach will reach right across Scotland as we provide £201 million of funding for city, region and growth deals, including provision for new deals in Stirling and Clackmanager, Tay Cities, Ayrshire and the Borderlands. We are pleased to maintain the most competitive business rates regime in the UK with the lowest poundage anywhere in the UK and we will implement a new lower intermediate property rate for properties with a rateable value of between 51,000 and 95,000. Taken together, those decisions will have the number of properties liable for the higher property rate and ensure that over 95% of properties pay a lower poundage than they would in other parts of the UK. The budget maintains a generous package of reliefs benefiting over 150,000 properties, including the Small Business Bonus Scheme and Business Growth Accelerator, reliefs which are worth an estimated £744 million in 2020-21. Presiding officer, we are pleased that sense has prevailed and Parliament has supported the Scottish Government, the business community and COSLA in approving the non-domestic rates bill, which delivers on our agreed measures from the Barclay Review. This bill supports growth. It improves the administration of the system and it increases fairness for ratepayers. This budget delivers a range of other measures that will support growth in our economy. We're providing an additional £16 million, £16 million of support for the National Manufacturing Institute and we are increasing the trade and the investment budget by a quarter. We're also investing in the fundamentals of our future economy with increased resources for Skills Development Scotland and real terms increases for our world-class universities and colleges with total investment of more than £2 billion, helping to ensure that we have the skills and research base that our economy needs. In total, this budget provides a multi-billion pound package of support for the economy using all the levers at our disposal, just when it needs it the most. Presiding officer, at a time when the UK government seems to have cast our economy aside in favour of Brexit, this government will work tirelessly to bring certainty and inclusive growth to the economy of Scotland. <laughs> Presiding officer, we must also build a well-being economy, one that values growth, but which also strives to be inclusive and fair. We know that challenges in our economy often have the hardest impact on those who are already vulnerable. And that's why we're announcing a progressive budget which targets support at those on lower incomes and in most need of support. 
It's also one of the reasons that we fought hard to win greater control over social security. This coming year will be truly transformational for two reasons. Firstly, we will see an uplift of nearly £3 billion in the total value of social security expenditure under our control as we administer the attendance allowance, disability living allowance, industrial injuries disablement allowance, personal independence payment and severe disablement allowance for the first time. And secondly, we will provide £21 million of funding for the game-changing new Scottish child payment of £10 per week with initial rollout commencing later this year. It is estimated that at full rollout in 2022, this will lift 30,000 children out of poverty. Presiding officer, when powers rest in Scotland's hands and not in Westminster's control, we will use them wisely and decisively to build a fairer country. We're also providing wider support to tackle poverty and to help progress towards the target to have child poverty by 2030. We'll continue to invest from the £50 million Tackling Child Poverty Fund and will increase the Scottish Welfare Fund by over 7% to provide more support to those hit by Tory welfare cuts. Through our public sector pay policy, we'll provide a 3% increase in basic pay for those earning up to £80,000 with additional support to those on lower incomes through an underpin of £750 for those earning £25,000 or less. And we will continue to pay and promote the real living wage. We'll provide additional funding to help the most disadvantaged ask, access further and higher education. And we will invest £645 million in our radical expansion of early learning and childcare. Providing from August this year, 1140 hours of high quality childcare that will boost the education of children at a crucial time in their development and also reduce the financial burden of childcare costs on young families. In total, based on previous estimates, we expect to spend no less than £1.4 billion in 2020 21 on supporting low income households before taking into account the remaining devolution of social security benefit. The impacts of austerity continue to be felt and we face an uncertain future due to Brexit. But rest assured, presiding officer, this government can be relied upon to act with compassion, investing in the fairer and more equal society all of us would like to see. Presiding officer, in a parliament of minorities, good governance demands compromise and pragmatism on all sides. This is a budget that speaks to the priorities of the country. I'm sure every party can find a reason to agree with it, but those who wish to find partisan reasons to oppose it should understand the devastating consequences of doing so. The emergency provisions enshrined in the Scotland Act are wholly inadequate for the parliament of a modern economy. If no budget is passed, the law mandates that public expenditure is capped at the level of the previous year. No £1 billion increase to our health and care services or the additional £500 million for local authorities and our police and universities and colleges would all be denied a real terms increase in their budgets. But worst of all, as a consequence of the further devolution of social security payments, nearly £3 billion of vital support will be denied to those in our society who need it the most. Now is not the time for brinkmanship. At a time when Westminster is far from representing Scotland's interests, it's time for Holyrood to demonstrate clearly and with purpose that we are willing and able to act in the national interest. And in order to achieve that, the government will be willing to compromise, but we want to be clear on the parameters of that compromise. This is a budget that fully allocates the resources at our disposal and addresses the priorities of the nation. It reflects our ambition for our country, our determination to eliminate child poverty, to accelerate the transition to a net zero economy and improve 
the collective well-being of our society through first-class public services and a social security system built with human dignity at its core. In doing so, we have used every fiscal lever we have to the fullest extent. Every penny is accounted for, including the £100 million in the reserve, held to ensure we can manage future tax reconciliations and any volatility in social security expenditure. If any party in this chamber wants to see spending increases or tax cuts, or in some cases both, they will need to be clear with the Scottish people, not just about what they want, but how it will be paid for. In presenting its budget to you today, the Scottish Government has made an assessment of the promises made to the people of Scotland by the UK Government, and this budget relies on them fulfilling their commitments. We have had little choice but to take the Tories' promises at face value. Their majority at Westminster is, after all, one on the back of a promise to end austerity. But we have heard those promises before, and yet the crippling reality of Tory austerity continues to bite. And just last week, there was widespread reports that all UK government departments were being ordered to identify savings of 5%, an order issued by none other than Boris Johnson and Sajid Javid. It seems that old habits die hard for the Tories. If the UK government does not live up to its promises, we will have to take the unprecedented step of returning to this chamber with budget revisions that make cuts to the spending plans that I have outlined today. If that happens, the responsibility will lie clearly at the door of the UK government. Presiding officer, as a parliament, we face a choice. Time is of the essence and we must choose soon. We propose a budget that delivers for our public services, that invests in the path to net zero emissions, that boosts our economy, and through the new child payment, delivers a game changer in the fight against child poverty. This Scottish government's choice is clear. This budget delivers for the people of Scotland and I commend it to the chamber. Thank you very much. And the Minister will now take questions on the Budget Statement. Murder Fraser to be followed by Ruda Grant. Murder Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking the Minister for advance sight of her statement? And I can, can I congratulate her on her delivery of it this afternoon in circumstances none of us wanted to see? As an aside, I believe this is the first time the Scottish Budget has been delivered by a woman and by an English qualified chartered accountant. Presiding officer, the backdrop to this budget is a substantial increase in the block grant thanks to extra spending at Westminster. The Scottish Government is benefiting from a Boris bonus worth at least £1.1 <laughs> billion pounds in real terms. And what is essential is that this money is not squandered but used to the benefit of the Scottish people. And against that budget increase, there can be no case for additional tax rises or for any further cuts in our vital frontline services. Presiding officer, our priorities for this budget are to see measures to help grow the Scottish economy and to support vital public services. When it comes to tax, we have been very clear that there must be no further divergence between Scottish personal taxation and that payable elsewhere in the United Kingdom. And what the Minister announced today on tax thresholds will widen the tax differential and that is not something that we could support. Because what we know, thanks to the Fraser of Allender Institute, is that the tax changes introduced by the former Finance Secretary, egged on by the Greens, making Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom, haven't actually raised any additional revenue for the Scottish public services. All they have done is fill the black hole that's been created by the fact that the Scottish economy is growing more slowly than the rest of the UK under the SNP's stewardship. Presiding officer, we know that over the past year, the Scottish economy has grown at less than half the UK rate, and I expect the Fiscal Commission will tell us today that that trend is continuing. So no additional taxes would be appropriate. And that is why in this budget, we need to see action to support business. The announcement on reducing the large business supplement is welcome, but doesn't go far enough for us or indeed for business, particularly large retail, which is suffering at the moment. Presiding officer, we welcome the extra money for health, only made possible because of additional spending by the UK government. 
And when it comes to local government, which has borne the brunt of cuts in previous budgets, well, we've been very clear that that cannot be the case this year. Councils are key to initiatives to tackle climate change, but when their budgets are cut, they cannot progress those. So we, so we will scrutinise very closely the additional commitments put upon councils to ensure they are fully funded with no hidden cuts to the core grant as in previous years. Presiding officer, I have two specific questions to ask the Finance Minister. Firstly, she has told us that every penny at her disposal is accounted for. Of course, we heard that exact line year on year from her former boss. But miraculously, in the three to four weeks after producing her, his budget, he would suddenly find a few hundred million pounds extra down the back of his sofa to lubricate his budget negotiations. So perhaps the Finance Secretary, Finance Minister can save us all a bit of time by telling us today exactly how much money is hidden away in addition to what's in the budget before us. That would make forward budget discussions much easier because we will give this budget serious consideration and we are prepared to engage seriously with the Scottish Government as to whether this budget is something we can support. And finally, Presiding Officer, would the Finance Minister accept that all the additional spending in Scotland benefits from is supported by the union dividend, now worth nearly £2,000 for every man, woman and child in Scotland? Without this, without this, we learnt this week, Scotland would be facing a deficit of over £10 billion, now up to 7.3% of GDP. Will she acknowledge that it is Scotland's place in the United Kingdom, coupled with this year's Boris bonus, that supports this budget and public services in Scotland? Thank you, Minister Ra Rather than pretending that there's a, a Boris bonus, I think the Tories should be starting off by apologising for the decade of austerity that they've subjected this country to. talk about extra many money we have not seen a single penny of that and if the UK government was so confident of investing more in the Scottish government's budget why have they introduced so much uncertainty by delaying that very budget in terms of in terms of taxation murder Fraser knows that his position on tax is not sustainable for the majority of people this is the lowest tax part of the UK but for everybody it is the fairest and the reason that we can invest in our public services is because the fundamentals of our economy are strong and because we have mitigated the impact of Tory austerity with our tax decisions. Now, in terms of the two questions that Murder Fraser asked, I can confirm that every penny has been deployed. The uncertainty caused by the UK government's budget delay means that we are not playing games. This is not the time for brinkmanship and we have deployed every penny on the face of the bill. This is an honest presentation of what the Scottish Government believes the priorities should be for the people of Scotland. And in terms of the union dividend, if the union dividend is austerity for 10 years that's hit our public services and a Brexit that we didn't vote for that's hit our economy, then I'm not sure that's a great selling point for the union dividend. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Rhoda Grant. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Kate Forbes to her role in delivering the budget statement today and thank her for a prior copy of the statement. Presiding officer, despite additional powers and financial levers that have come to the Scottish Parliament over the last decade, the SNP government have failed to maximise their use. Leaving our country, our people and our essential services worse off. They have endeavoured to hide that through smoke and mirrors, and that is the case again today. They tried to avoid scrutiny, but they must come clean with the people of Scotland and tell them what choices they are making on their behalf. Scottish Labour wants transformational change. We want investment in the future. We know that we cannot reverse 13 years of mismanagement in one budget. So acknowledging that, we have asked the Scottish Government in this year's budget to take a step in the right direction, to take a step towards real change. We have asked that they invest in the future by tackling climate change and prioritising getting our young people onto buses. Scottish Labour delivered free bus travel that was transformational for older people. We must now do the same for our younger people under 25s, giving them the choice that will follow them into adulthood. And it will benefit the whole country by encouraging everyone 
out of their cars and onto public transport. Scottish Labour are also sick of hearing about people being trapped in hospital when they should be at home. And it's costing a fortune and holding people hostage. We want to see a step change in local government funding to allow them to invest in the services that people need to help them escape from hospital and into the comfort of their own homes. We want to boost the economy by investing in education and skills that our country needs, not only for young people, but for everyone, equipping them for the future of automation and digitisation. Our further and higher education used to lead the world. Let us aspire to be world leaders again. Let our communities thrive again. Let us push for excellence in health and social care services. And let us reverse austerity, austerity and change the future. Presiding officer, this budget is a disappointment. And what's worse, it lets down the Scottish people. It's a time for investment. Can the minister please tell me exactly how their spending plans will meet our ambitions to invest in the future for all of Scotland? Will it actually tackle climate change? Will it allow young people freedom and independence to go to work and play? Will it educate young people and a workforce for the challenges that are ahead? And will it equip our, custom, our councils to protect our communities? And will it once and for all put an end to delayed discharge? Minister. Rhoda Grant for that question. What's disappointing is that last year for a party that claims to be about mitigating austerity, the Labour Party voted against a budget last year that contained £1.4 billion directly linked to mitigating austerity for our most vulnerable, including, including measures that directly mitigated UK welfare decisions. And in this year's budget, the Labour Party have a choice. Will they vote for or against? a uh, um, commitment in this year's budget to deliver the first child payments that will, by 2022, take 30,000 children out of poverty. That, that is the choice that we'll Labour that. faces. I am yeah. proud to be presenting this budget today because it's a budget that delivers in the national interest. It's a budget that delivers an additional £1 billion for health, an additional half a billion pounds for local government, and real terms increases for colleges and universities. The question for Labour is if they have good ideas and I'm willing to listen and to compromise whether they tell us how much it will cost and if it costs more than the overall allocation that we have, we what they will cut in order to deliver it. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Rooney. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Kate Forbes is taking on a difficult task, stepping into the breach to lead a budget process on a very short timescale and with no finance secretary uh, in the cabinet. All political parties have a responsibility to be constructive in that process, but Kate Forbes is also going to have to be constructive with us uh, in trying to build the political agreement that hasn't been built prior to the introduction of the budget. There is much talk of the climate emergency uh, in the document and in uh, Kate Forbes' uh, statement to Parliament. And the area where Scotland is clearly failing on climate is transport, where emissions are going up, not down, and that's largely due to long-standing government policies. And yesterday's transport strategy contained little sign of the substantial changes that are needed if we're going to get the progress uh, that we need to see. In the budget, I can find no evidence of a shift away from the damaging, traffic-inducing transport projects that the government has been supporting up until now. Making that kind of shift would free up the resources that are necessary to invest in reversing the decades-long trend toward ever more expensive public transport. And the widely supported policy that Greens have been advocating for months, uh, and as have the Labour Party, of free bus travel for young people would be a substantial step in this direction. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, given the tight timescales involved, can Kate Forbes give a clear assurance that she will look with an open mind at all of those options, which Greens and others are putting forward for transformational change, and that this budget is not presented on a take it or leave it basis? 
Minister. I thank Patrick Harvey for that question and I'm very happy to confirm to the Chamber and to all parties that I will be very willing to be very constructive and I hope that the same goes for them when it comes to engaging with the budget. I do believe that this budget recognises our responsibilities to tackle climate change and it does deliver a climate budget. As of today, the government will be spending 1% of GDP in tackling climate change just in terms of capital. Capital on infrastructure projects which Patrick Harvey mentioned and that doesn't include the additional measures that we are taking including significant increases in resource expenditure on peatland and the green growth accelerator. Now we recognise that when it comes to low carbon infrastructure we want to see the proportion of spend on that going up and the proportion of spend on high carbon infrastructure going down. We want to see that trend. We believe we've made a step change in this budget today. But as always, my door is open and I'm very happy to listen to all parties. Thank you very much. Call Willie Rennie to be followed by Rona Mackay. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Minister for an advanced copy of the statement. It does include measures that we support. But does she not think there should have been references to all the projects across Scotland that are overspent to the tune of hundreds of millions of pounds? including the AWPR, the Sick Kids Hospital, the ferries and the hospitals today in Aberdeen that we found out about. Councils have only been given half of what they need. Does she not accept that that will hit local services, including the promises that the government has made on their behalf? Now, forgive me for being a little bit sceptical, but ministers always say that they have no spare money when it comes to the budget negotiations before revealing secret pots of money. So forgive me for being sceptical about that. Does the budget allow for any spending on independence? But I agree with the Minister on Brexit. And we could agree with the Minister on this budget too, if the Minister clears the pathway to make that happen. Is that her objective? Minister. I sometimes worry that the Lib Dems are more obsessed with independence than I am. Yeah. And in the last few budgets, the, U the, the Lib Dems have prioritised the union over support for increased spend in mental health, in education, in infrastructure and in all of our other commitments. And the Lib Dems, the Lib Dems have a choice with this budget to actually get involved, participate uh, and be willing to compromise, to work with us to deliver a budget. In terms of local government, we have provided a cash increase of almost half a billion pounds to local authorities. And the settlement provides for our commitments on early learning and childcare, on teachers' pay and on pensions. So local authorities, in terms of real terms, as well as cash increases, will see their resource budget going up. But if Willie Rennie believes strongly in a particular area of spend, then my door is open and I look forward to speaking to him. Thank you very much. Now, all the parties have had their opening statements as well as questions, so a uh, large number of members wish to ask questions. If we keep the questions concise, the answers concise, we'll get through all members. Rona Mackay to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the announcement that for the first time ever, health and social care partnerships will receive more than £9.4 billion in spite of the fact that Scotland's annual budget uh, fell in real terms by £1.5 billion over the last decade. Can the Minister expand on how that funding will be distributed? Minister. Well, our budget does prioritise investment in frontline services and takes funding for frontline NHS boards to £11.3 billion. And that sees additional investment of £454 million in our frontline boards, which is an increase of 4.2%, something I hope that all parties will welcome. And our budget therefore goes above and beyond the level of funding demand that we recognised in the medium term financial framework. And through that approach, we will build on our record level of frontline health spending in Scotland, which is 136 pounds per person higher than in England. And we'll deliver a shift in the balance of care towards mental health and to primary social and community care. Next year, we'll invest more than £9.4 billion in health and social care partnerships, and we'll also make an additional £12.7 million available to tackle the harm associated with the use of illicit drugs and alcohol. Thank you. Dean Lockhart, to be followed by Alex Neal. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In her opening statement, the Minister said that if any party wants to see spending increases or tax cuts or both, they need to explain how they will be paid for. The answer is simple, Minister. We need to grow the economy and the re reverse the decline of the last 13 years. Yeah. Yesterday, the SNP confirmed that the Scottish economy had grown 5% less in the last 13 yeah. years than the UK economy. And today, the SFC is forecasting another five years of low growth and low wages in Scotland. Let's be clear. This is not about Brexit because the rest of the UK is now growing more than twice the rate of Scotland. Presiding officer, this is a piecemeal budget full of window dressing from a tired government. So let me ask the minister, when will she start listening to us and take real action to restore economic growth to Scotland? Yeah. Minister. Listening to the Tories would require me to do something impossible, which is to see tax cuts and spending increases, which is accounting, in accounting terms, completely impossible. In terms of growing tax take and uh, growing the economy, it's very clear in, in the evidence that we've seen, and certainly business is very clear as well, that the thing that's harming the economy right now is the uncertainty caused by Brexit. And the thing that would grow our economy fastest is being able to have the talent and the skills come into this country through population growth. Now, where do those levers lie? With Westminster, who are refusing to allow that to happen. Alec Neil to be followed by Sarah Boyer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first of all congratulate the Minister on her excellent delivery of the budget? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And I'm not going to make any criticism. I'm just going to ask a simple question about a very specific matter. And it's to ask the Minister if she will look at the impact of water charges on small businesses and in particular review the policies and practices of business stream who still insist on charging some small businesses for water they don't even use. And that's having an adverse impact on a, quite a number of small businesses up and down the length and breadth of Scotland. Minister. Well, I suppose uh, briefly, I'm very happy to agree to consider the issues that Alex Neil has set out. As a government, we are committed to supporting our small businesses, which are the backbone of our economy. Thank you, Sarah Boyack, to be followed by Julian Martin. We know for 2020 to 21 that there are nearly £500 million of new Scottish government commitments which our councils will have to deliver. Will the Minister guarantee that the Scottish Government will fully fund these new commitments in addition to the core budget and not at its expense? And will she tell us what new money is being allocated to local authorities to address the damaging impact of previous SNP budget cuts and the growing pressures our communities face? Minister. Well, I, I'm delighted to announce today that local government will get, in cash terms, almost half a billion pounds to spend on delivering the services that the people of Scotland need and require. And the settlement, as I confirmed earlier, also provides for our commitments of early learning and childcare, teachers' pay and pensions. But as I've said before, and I'll say again, over the course of the next few weeks, with short time constraints, we have the opportunity to work collaboratively with any party in this place, and that includes the Labour Party. So if the Labour Party can be clear about what their priorities are and how they're going to cost them and fund them, then we're more than delighted to discuss those. Gillian Martin, to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. As someone who represents a constituency where just transition away from high carbon jobs is an acute challenge but a necessity, I welcome the announcement of the Green Growth Accelerator to support local authorities to invest in measures that will reduce emissions and support new green jobs. Will the Minister uh, join me in urging all local authorities, but particularly those like Aberdeenshire Council, to bring forward proposals to ensure the potential of the Green Growth Accelerator is maximised? Well, I agree with Gillian Martin that local authorities have a critical role to play in responding to the climate emergency. We need them to deploy the key levers that they have at their disposal, whether that's capital budgets or other resources. Um, their ownership of local land and assets and the responsibility in terms of local planning and regulatory frameworks um, is key in all of this. And as Gillian Martin said, the Green Growth Accelerator model is designed to support those local authorities to use those levers in concert with other local authorities and public sector partners to drive that transformative change that we want to see and we need to see. 
Miles Briggs, to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Can I welcome the Minister to her position in what's probably going to be the longest job interview in history? But despite the biggest cash injection in the history of our NHS today, can I ask the Minister, why have the Scottish Government failed to end the underfunding of health boards, including her own in Highland, and failed to reverse cuts to rehab beds? Minister. Well, on the contrary, and I'm glad uh, Miles Briggs has welcomed the record funding in health. I hope he continues that theme throughout the year in terms of welcoming this government's investment and prioritisation of the health service. But in terms of the two areas he mentioned, um, I, I note that the, the Tories have uh, discussed at length the uh, uh, NRAC and uh, they've they provided costings. I, I don't think those costings are, are strictly accurate unless he's going to cut other budgets as well to deliver that. And in terms of uh, rehab beds, which is a really important issue, I believe when it comes to these very complex problems, we need complex solutions and we need new solutions. There's not a simple solution, but that's why we've increased um, by nearly 60% the funding that is going on reducing harm um, from alcohol and drugs. And that funding will be focused on supporting reduction in drug deaths to allow our new drug death task force to support innovative projects that work and also to test new approaches. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Monica Lynn. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this well-presented budget and the feisty answering of questions so far. Can the Minister confirm that the Rail Services budget will increase by a thumping 27.3% to more than one and a quarter billion pounds? and that ferry services will see a 9.5 increase to 255.1 million, almost triple what it was when this government came to office, a plus almost 50 million pounds for Ferguson Marine. Uh, I can confirm all of the above, and I'm particularly delighted as an MSP that represents a constituency that relies on our ferries to see that increase in support towards our lifeline ferry services. Uh, Monica Lennon to be followed by David Torrance. Thank you. The Minister talked about the importance of governments keeping promises. This government promised to end delayed discharge, but that promise remains unfulfilled. Can the Minister confirm what assessment has been carried out of her spending plans to establish if they will fully meet the need that exists and when government expects that we can see an end to delayed discharge? Minister. Well, as Monica Lennon will see from the increased spend throughout this budget, we are ensuring that there is an increase in frontline spend uh, within our health service in particular to be able to deal with the challenging issues that she has identified. The Scottish budget continues to shift the balance of care and we focus on our twin approaches of, yes, increased investment, but also of reform. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary for Health is doing a fantastic job in ensuring that's happening. David Torrance to be followed by Liz Smith. Can the Minister confirm how much the Scottish Government is providing to support capitalisation of the Scottish National Investment Bank and how this will boost economic growth in Scotland? Minister. I can confirm in answer to the member that in order to continue our progress towards um, our commitment to provide £2 billion over 10 years to fund the National Investment Bank, we have in this year's budget the direct investment available of £220 million. And that's in addition to the existing £150 million Building Scotland Fund. The bank, and I know the bank enjoys cross-party support, will help support and positively impact on Scotland's economy through the provision of a mission-based investment and will develop its own pipelines for investment to ensure that we're investing in the Scottish economy, not just for next year, but for generations to come. Liz Smith, be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you. On page 120 of the budget book, um, the government states that it will maintain at least 116,000 full-time equivalent college places, but I can't see anything about the um, maintenance of part-time places, which are obviously so crucial to the economy. Could the minister tell us any detail about what resources will be available for part-time college places? Minister. The figure relates to full-time term equi full equivalent. So in that sense, the, the budget continues to commit to funding college places. But I hope Liz Smith welcomes the commitment in this budget to deliver a real terms increase, both for higher education and for further, ed further education. John Mason, be followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'm uh, correct in saying that in 1920, the maximum limit that uh, councils could increase council tax was 4.79%. 
and in fact only 12 councils took it to that level, so the average was 3.6. Can the Minister say what the equivalents are for this year? If yes. councils take up the full flexibility to increase their council tax levels by up to 3% in real terms uh, next year, then that would generate an additional £135 million to support council services. Claudia Beebish to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In light of the climate emergency, I welcome some commitments by the Scottish Government while needing reassurance, um, if not today, um, this is indeed new money. However, uh, can, the, can the Minister um, tell us what methodology the Scottish Government has assessed this budget by to be sure it is one that will deliver rapid and transformational change with just transition for Scotland across all portfolios, given that the results of the Commission review on capital expenditure and emissions is not yet in place. Minister. I thank the member and I think I remember giving evidence to her committee on this issue in terms of methodology and ensuring that our, our budget delivers our aspirations and ambitions on climate change and she'll know that this builds on the 2019 Climate Change Act and also this year's programme for government to deliver um, on the elements that I mentioned in my opening remarks. But we are very proud of this budget in terms of a significant increase in investment in our climate change aspirations. But of course, in one sense, this is just the start. So whilst it's a significant investment, we look forward to continuing to build on that, not just this year, but through the years to come. And I think you see that most clearly when it comes to peatlands restoration, a commitment of 20 million this year, but a commitment for 250 million pounds over the next period. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can the Minister provide a guarantee that the new budget line for Ferguson Marine and Port Glasgow will ensure it will safeguard jobs, protect the economy of my community, and that this budget line will be protected when she has discussions with the other parties in this chamber? Minister. <clears throat> well, Stuart McMillan uh, may see the 2021 Scottish budget includes almost £50 million to fund the delivery of vessels 801 and 802 in line with the revised schedule and the costs presented to Parliament by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. The Scottish Government is committed to funding the completion of the two ferries currently under construction at the Yard. Thank you. Adam Tompkins, to be followed by Emma Hart. Uh, last week, the Fraser Vanander Institute told the Finance Committee that no additional revenues have been raised by the SNP's income tax hikes because of weak growth in the Scottish tax base. So can the Minister tell me what specific policies are contained in this budget to grow the Scottish tax base? Minister? Well, in terms of our investment in this year's budget, it is significantly helped by our decisions about tax policy. And of course, I'm delighted that over the last year, there's been an additional £500 million to invest that wouldn't have been there if the Tories had had their way. But in terms of this budget, this budget significantly invests in our economy. It protects our reliefs, which the Tories were putting at risk as recently as last week. And it ensures that we have the most competitive relief scheme anywhere in the UK, uh, lower than a inflation rise in the poundage, a lower poundage rate for 95% of businesses uh, in, uh, in Scotland um, compared with the rest of the UK. But perhaps most significantly, it also invests significantly in infrastructure, which is a key way of uh, boosting the economy. Yeah. Emma Harper to be followed by Colin Smith. In the report published on January the 27th by the Infrastructure Commission for Scotland, it states that we must have, and I quote, a presumption in favour of investment to future-proof existing road infrastructure to make it safer, resilient and more reliable. Given this, can the Minister therefore outline how much the Scottish Government has committed in its budget to improving roads infrastructure, especially for roads in the south-west of Scotland? Minister. Thank the member. We are committed to delivering transport projects which will help us to create the conditions for an inclusive and net zero emissions economy. And this government is increasing its budget for trunk road and structural repairs to over £123 million next year. And through the operating companies will continue to safely maintain and operate the trunk road network. And in the South West will continue to progress construction of the A77 bypass with completion expected in summer 2021. And consideration of further improvements to the A75 and A77 will form part of the Strategic Transport Projects Review. Colin Smith to be followed by Fulton McGregor. 
Thank you, President Officer. Bus passenger numbers have plummeted by a staggering 108 million journeys under the SNP. When Labour introduced the free bus pass for older people, it resulted in the biggest increase in bus passenger numbers we've had since devolution. Does the Minister accept that even with the measures in this budget, it won't begin to reverse the decline in bus usage, but if free bus travel was extended to young people, we really could start to halt the dismantling of our bus network taking place in every community now under this government. First Minister. Well, I'm sure the member therefore welcomes the commitment in this budget to increase overall funding for rail and bus services, including concessionary travel, by £286 million to a total of £1.15 billion next year. But the member mentioned free bus travel for under 25s, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. I just want Labour to tell me how much it would cost. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Liam Kerr. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, thank you, President Officer. The Minister has outlined significant additional investment to complete the expansion of early learning childcare. Can she outline how much of this is expected to save families each year? Minister. Uh, this government will save families up to four and a half thousand pounds per child per year. Yeah, yeah. Liam Kerr to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. From her statement, the Minister seems unaware that crime has risen for the last two years and violent crime for the last four years. Now, the Chief Constable says that without more cash and, and more officers, there will be a crisis in policing and some crimes will not be investigated. The Chief Constable says he can't afford to lose more officers and less than 50 million means he'll have to. So with this budget, is the Minister saying the Chief Constable is wrong? And can the Chief Constable take it that this is the statutory consent from the Minister that the SPA may add to the deficit? Minister. With this budget, I'm saying something quite simple. I'm saying that the overall SPA budget will increase by 3.6% next year, which is an additional £42.2 million. So for a member who takes an active interest in these things, I hope he will welcome our priority given to the police force and ensuring that there is figures in this uh, budget to protect our police officers and to invest in the estate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Willie Coffey to be followed by Ian Gray. Thank you. The Minister announced an extra £1 billion in infrastructure investment. Could she set out what's included in that funding and how many jobs that would support in Scotland? Thank you. Minister. Well, this £6.2 billion of investment is estimated to support over 40,000 full-time equivalent jobs in 2020-21 and the budget includes funding for an array of infrastructure to support our long-term ambitions for inclusive economic growth, building sustainable places and responding to the climate emergency. It includes over £200 million of funding for city, region and growth deals, £120 million for expansion of places for early learning and childcare, support for progress on our elective care health centres and funding required to meet our commitment to deliver 50,000 affordable homes. Ian Gray to be followed by Jenny Gilbreth. Thank you. The Minister has spoken several times of a rise in higher education funding, but that rise is half what Universities Scotland say they need, uh, and less than a tenth of the cuts they've suffered in recent years. Isn't that just continuing to sell this critical sector short? Minister. Well, I've already confirmed that this budget provides a real terms increase in funding for higher education and further education. The question for the Labour Party is whether they'll vote against that real terms increase or not. Yeah. Yeah. Gilruth to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sure fellow Justice Committee members, perhaps excluding Liam Kerr, will welcome the additional £37 million for the police budget. Will the Scottish Government continue to press the UK Treasury to pay back the £125 million in VAT paid by Police Scotland to the UK Treasury between 2013 and 2018? Minister. We will, of course, continue to press the UK Government on these matters and considering how many spending asks the Tories have, it would be nice if once in a while they directed those spending asks to their own uh, UK Government. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie Green to be followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you, Mr. Uh, despite warm words about improving transport and infrastructure, the detail in the budget paints a very different picture. To answer Emma Harper's question, there is an £85 million drop in funding for motorways in trunk roads. 
flatline budgets to support councils with cycling and walking, cuts to regional transport partnerships, cuts to smart card rollout, cuts to support for bus services. So let me ask you, Minister, given that the Green Party has placed a budget demand on you that the SNP backtrack on its existing commitments to improve Scotland's roads, is today's draft budget a worrying sign that the Scottish Government is capitulating to those ridiculous demands? Interestingly enough, I don't recall additional spending on roads being one of the Tories' asks. No, exactly. So I wonder whether that is a new ask to add to their already under-costed lists of demands. But in terms of transport, I've already mentioned that we've increased overall spending for rail and bus service, we've increased investment in active travel, we've invested in the Future Transport Fund to help support that modal shift. There is significant investment in this budget and if Jamie Green can't find him in himself to welcome that, then I don't think there's that much hope for the general spend on transport. Yeah. <laughs> Alistair Allen to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Presiding officer, we know we need to repeat and extend the success of renewable electricity generation to renewable heat. Can the Minister expand on the measures outlined in the budget that will deliver on that ambition? Minister. Yes, I can. The £120 million uh, heat transition deal announced today is an ambitious and broad package of capital investment which will ensure that we make demonstrable progress towards decarbonising our homes and our buildings. And the deal complements and further strengthens our policy framework for renewable heat. We'll shortly introduce a heat networks bill which will help to de-risk investment in heat networks and later this year we'll also set out further detail on the steps we will take to reduce emissions from heating Scotland's homes and buildings in our heat decarbonisation policy statement. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Bob Doris. Kate Forbes will know through her constituency work the importance of investing in energy efficiency in our homes, which is one of the most transformational tools that we have to tackle the climate emergency and fuel poverty. It's also a prerequisite for the investment on heat that she's just described. The Greens, the Climate Emergency Response Group, Citizens of Ice Scotland, we've all called for the budget to be doubled, and yet we only see a very marginal increase in this budget. How will the government meet its own fuel poverty and climate targets without the scale of investment. And will Kate Force be prepared to bring that spirit of compromise and pragmatism to negotiations on this issue as well? Minister. Well, I can confirm to the member that I have a great spirit of compromise and I'm more than happy to talk to the member further about these issues. We recognise that in order to meet our climate change ambitions, we're going to have to consider our investment in every area of infrastructure. And whilst um, this uh, budget demonstrates a significant uh, increase in spend on a uh, green infrastructure as it were we are also um, increasing our spend on energy efficiency too. Thank you Bob Doris to be followed by Graham Simpson. And drug deaths are a major blight on the communities that I serve. Can I ask the minister how this budget will support services for those in addiction and ultimately help them into recovery including enhancing the provision of rehabilitation beds and improving the recovery pathway more widely. I thank the member for that question and I can confirm that the significant increase in investment that we have committed to today in terms of funding to reduce harm from alcohol and drugs will look at different ways, different innovative ways, different projects in order to do that. Ultimately, we all want to see a reduction in drug deaths. Thank you. Graeme Simpson to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you. Um, if all councils increase council tax by the maximum amount, will any still have to make spending cuts? Minister. Well, we ensure that we work in partnership with local authorities and as I've said repeatedly, we are ensuring that there's a cash increase going to local authorities of just short of half a billion pounds. It's then for local authorities who have complete autonomy over 92% of their budget, how they spend that. Mike Rumbles to be followed by Annabel Ewing. The Minister hasn't said anything at all about cutting waste in the budget. Does she have anything to say about, firstly, paying an extra £62 million for a botched fixed price contract for the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route? Wasting over £200 million on ferries Calmac doesn't want? and wasting £40 million on a loss-making airport that's made losses every year for the last 10 years. 
That's over three hundred million pounds of now listen, that's over three hundred million pounds of waste. And I appreciate the advice he's getting from the Deputy First Minister. Minister. Well, I find that quite offensive, frankly, if the member thinks that investing £200 million on ferries that my constituents and the other constituents across this country need is a waste. I think, he might, I think he might find that his own constituents find it questionable that he thinks that spending on the AWPR was also a waste. We will continue to invest in infrastructure and transport projects as we intend to do through this budget. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Neil Findlay. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the MSP for Cowton Beath constituency, can the Minister highlight the key benefits? of uh, the budget as far as the good people of Fife are concerned. Minister. Well, I can confirm to the member that this is a budget that delivers for the people of her constituency as it does for the people across this country. It provides certainty for ratepayers, it invests in our economy, it steps up our commitment to tackling climate change and it tackles the challenges of child poverty. And I think those are all measures that every person in Scotland will welcome. Neil Finlay to be followed by Peter Chapman. It's uh, not unusual to support elements of the budget without supporting it in its entirety. Indeed, SNP groups on local authorities do this all the time. So, in that vein, can I welcome the fact that the government has accepted my proposal on page 50 of the budget for a £1 million fund to help mesh injured women? This will be warmly welcome. And could I ask the Minister to bring forward the scheme to allow women to claim from that fund as quickly as possible? Minister. Um, I thank Neil Finlay for the spirit in which he made those remarks and asked that question and I'm glad that he welcomes that commitment and I'm sure that um, in collaboration with the Health Secretary we could look at these issues. Mr Chapman to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. I thank you, Presiding Officer, and I declare an interest. Order, please. Order, please. They would likely complain if I didn't declare an interest, presiding officer. <laughs> the minister made much in her statement, and we all know how important the environment is. But I see agri-environment scheme payments are actually down again for the third year in a row. Hardly looking after the environment, minister. Minister. I thank the member for that question and we recognise that we need to work in partnership with our farmers and land managers in order to meet our commitments on climate change and that's why I hope that he also welcomes the initial £40 million of investment in the Agricultural Transformation Programme which is a programme that will develop pilot schemes to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, invest in on-farm renewables and tree planting uh, amongst other measures. So we're committed to supporting the agricultural industry, make that shift and we want to do it in collaboration with them. Thank you Stuart Stevenson to be followed by James Kelly. Stuart Stevenson. Um, Minister, I'm uh, reading the carbon assessment of the uh, budget proposals and uh, there's lots of good news there. Is there anything in particular uh, that the government is doing besides what it says on page uh, four where the emissions spending, uh, uh, spending to mitigate emissions has increased. Um, can she give us any further information as to how spending is going to be targeted very specifically on carbon? Well, I think what's interesting about this budget is not only the high-level figures in terms of our investment in peatland restoration, in the heat transition deal, in our future transport fund, and investing in our priorities. There's also significant investment in how we work with people in order to deliver on our uh, commitments around climate change as well. I mentioned already the investment in the Agricultural Transformation Programme, but we are also developing, for example, the £50 million heat network's early adopter challenge fund for local authorities and a £10 million fund to support hydrogen heat demonstrator projects. So not only do we want to be at the forefront when it comes to our climate change commitments, we also want to be pioneering solutions that the rest of the world can adopt. Yeah, yeah. And James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Page 145 of the Budget Book says in relation to the Legal Aid Budget that it supports criminal defence and redress uh, where rights are not being upheld. Can I therefore ask the Minister why the budget has been frozen at £137 million and no additional money has been provided for this crucial fund this year? Minister. I think the member, I'd be happy to speak to this member um, more generally after this statement. But we remain committed, and I think that's demonstrated in the figures before him just now, in terms of continuing to invest in what is a very important area of our budget. Thank you very much. And that concludes our budget statement. Thank you very much. We're going to move on shortly to our next item of business, which will be a debate on the Scottish Elections Reform Bill at Stage 1. But we'll just take a short pause while members uh, and ministers change seats. Just a short pause, not a suspension.